The Bell X-22 was one of the most versatile and longest-lived VSTOL aircraft ever developed. Unlike other aircraft of its kind, the Bell X-22 included a variable stability system in its basic design from its conception. This feature highly contributed to its versatility, performing VSTOL research that would later be applied to a variety of aircraft. But while the X-22 proved to be the most efficient aircraft of its brand, it still had a significant hurdle to overcome to make it suitable for operational service, improving its speed. Development By the early 1950s, Bell was experimenting with Vertical Takeoff and Landing, or VTOL, and was already looking into ducted fan configurations. These propellers were open to the elements, but were nonetheless able to perform like jet engines. Meanwhile, the Air Force was experimenting with the CL-346, a VTOL jet that would have scorched its landing site. A VTOL aircraft was needed in the three branches of the U.S. military, and a program to address all the requirements was put together. The objective was to create a few prototype VSTOL vehicles, use them for different concept operations, and then evaluate them on their usefulness. The Tri-Service VSTOL Transport Program was then born. The Air Force was highly interested in the tilt-wing concept, but the Navy had more specific problems due to shipboard compatibility. Studies showed that a dual tandem of ducted fans, unlike the previous Bell D-190, would allow for a shorter wingspan, and a model with four ducted fans was then developed. The ducts around the four propellers improved efficiency while providing safety for the personnel working in cramped flight decks. In addition, the stubbier design was able to fit into existing carrier elevators, erasing the need for more complex wing folding mechanisms. While the D-2064 model lost the contest to the tilt-wing XC-142A, the committee was so impressed with the design that Bell was still given a contract. In November of 1962, the Navy awarded Bell Helicopter with a $27.5 million contract to design and develop two prototypes. The internal designation of the new project was Model D-2127, which then changed to X-22. New Features The X-22 research aircraft had potential as a small VSTOL transport, able to carry a payload of 540 kilograms, or six commercial passengers, with only a crew of two. It was 11.9 meters long, and its maximum gross weight amounted to 16,000 pounds. In addition, the tanks in the fuselage carried 465 gallons of usable fuel. Its basic configuration comprised four ducts rotating together between vertical and horizontal positions while changing through several flight modes. Four General Electric YT-58 GE-8BD turboshaft engines powered it, adding 1,250 horsepower each. The engines were mounted in pairs at each wing route and were operated by a shared drive shaft. B and D designations on the engines referred to fuel controllers, which were automatically charged depending on the operation mode, whether hover or cruise. The X-22's power transmission system consisted of 10 gearboxes placed in an arrangement that allowed the four propellers to continue operating in case any of them failed or were deliberately shut down. Hamilton Standard built all the propellers. They were three-bladed, 2.1 meters in diameter, and made of fiberglass attached to a steel core. This configuration made them 25% lighter than metal props, while still giving them three times the fatigue strength. Placing the propellers inside the ducts resulted in high efficiency, as it was able to take off on three engines, fly on two, and land with only one running. As the four propellers were operated from a shared drive shaft, they all turned at the same speed. While at high speed, a precise thrust control was obtained by varying the blade angle. Four elevons placed at the rear of each duct fan assembly were the only control surfaces. They proved very effective, even at low speeds. Although the duct's rotation was controlled by hydraulic actuators, mechanical and electrical interconnections ensured all four rotated together. The takeoff was vertical, but the ducts turned to the forward flight position and rendered the aircraft wingborne for transition, rotating 5 degrees per second. 
The ducts also doubled as wings for horizontal flight, an efficient mode similar to the canard design and quite advanced for the 1960s. Even though the X-22 had a vertical stabilizer, there was no rudder. The movement of the elevons and changes to the duct pitch made up for flight control. Horizontal flight control used a conventional control stick for pitch and roll, which moved the elevons differentially between front and rear for pitch and left and right for roll. Meanwhile, yaw was controlled by rudder pedals, which changed the propeller's blade angle for differential thrust. The pilot would use the control stick for pitch and bank motions while hovering. The inputs signaled the computer to command minute changes to the blade angles and vary thrust, thus tipping forward, aft, or sideways. Thrust forces off vertical position directed the airframe properly. Yaw was also controlled by the rudder pedals, but the computer now differentiated movements of the elevons between left and right. In addition, pilots could rotate ducts for additional assistance during hover. Flight controls included a variable stability system designed by the Calspan Corporation of Buffalo, then known as Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory. A separate computer modified basic airplane responses to match the characteristics of real or imagined testing aircraft. This process is known as an in-flight simulator. The system followed algorithms specially created for each test and programmed into the computer, producing control surface motions that could be specific to each aircraft being tested and different from those of the X-22. Adding variable stability to the design proved a significant challenge to Bell, especially as there could be no hysteresis in any of the flight controls. This meant that when the pilot moved the control stick and let it go, it needed to return to its exact starting position, something that friction or surface irregularities often prevented. Still, the engineers were able to account for all the CalSpan specifications and assured the proper operation of the X-22. They also made sure that when operating the variable stability mode, the pilot in the left seat would have the same flight characteristics as the safety pilot in the right and be able to take control of the airframe at any given time. Testing the prototypes. The first X-22, with tail number 1520, rolled out in May of 1965, followed by 50 hours of propulsion tests. It would then make its first flight in hovering mode almost a year later, flying for 10 minutes while performing four takeoffs and landings and 180 degree turns. The first prototype made a series of STOL takeoffs and landings to test the ducks at 30 degrees, but it was damaged beyond repair on August 8, 1966. It had flown for 3.2 hours during its 15th flight, four miles from the base at Niagara Falls Airport, when it had a dual hydraulic failure. During its first transition from wingborne flight to vertical mode, the prototype was forced to land under high stress, and the fuselage broke in half. Fortunately, no one was harmed. The program was then delayed until the second prototype was ready. The second X-22, now with tail number 1521, flew in January of 1967. This aircraft served for years and was flown by test pilots from Bell and all branches of service. When testing was completed in January of 1971, the X-22 had completed 228 flights, 125 flight hours, 400 vertical takeoffs and landings, and over 200 STOLs. The aircraft could hover at 2,440 meters, reaching forward speeds of 507 kilometers per hour and a top speed of 370 kilometers per hour. The requirements called for a top speed of 525 kilometers per hour, rendering it a failure in this regard. In addition, its range was 716 kilometers, which was underwhelming, even if it was capable of double the speed in about the same range as modern helicopters. The second prototype demonstrated adequate basic stability and an effortless vertical takeoff and landing, which was considered a success despite its less stable ground operation. Also, its hovering mode was smoother than most helicopters. The X-22 had an excellent response to pilot input, and its transitions required minimum pilot workload while in horizontal flight. Landing positions were also controlled with precision, and the stability augmentation system helped the pilot immensely. The aircraft was deemed easier to control than a conventional plane, and more stable than a helicopter in hover mode, earning a reputation as the future of air travel. Good enough.
An attack military version and a flying boat were also developed, and at least 10 military and civilian models were lined up for development, but the X-22 never went into production. Every problem was eventually solved, but not satisfactorily enough for production. Thus, the aircraft was relegated for research purposes. However, the Navy was satisfied with its performance in this new task, and extended a contract to Cornell in July of 1970 to conduct more research. The X-22 would fly five test programs for the next 10 years, completing the last one in 1980. The program's office within the Navy was eventually disbanded, and the X-22 flew for the last time in 1984, after interest in VTOL technology had faded. There was an attempt to transfer it to the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, Florida, but they did not have a desire to display unconventional aircraft. Thus, the X-22 was stored at the Buffalo Airport, ready to be used when necessary. Its airframe was almost scrapped, but the engineers held onto it for years. Every effort to display the X-22 at a museum in West New York was in vain, and in 1995, it was moved outdoors while wrapped in protective plastic to empty space in the hangar. Finally, in 1998, the Niagara Aerospace Museum at Niagara Falls acquired it, giving a home to the promising and unique-looking VSTOL aircraft. Thank you for watching our video. Please give us a thumbs up, and let us know your thoughts on the Bell X-22 having never been produced in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels.